Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here, that you set your alarms uh, an hour ahead, or you just used your phones and they did it for you. Um, Whatever you did, we're glad you're here, and we are uh, exceedingly joyous to worship our living God together. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. From Exodus 12. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Let us bow our hearts low and worship our God. This morning 
is from Revelation 5, 9 through 14. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy worthy to take take the scroll scroll and to to open open its seals, because because you were slain. slain. And And with with your your blood you you purchased purchased for God persons persons from from every every tribe tribe and and language and people and and nation. You You have have made them to be a kingdom and and priests to to serve our God, and they they will reign reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to to receive power and and wealth and and wisdom and and strength and and honor and and glory and and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To To him who sits on the throne and and to the Lamb be 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 praise and honor and and glory and and power forever and ever. ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped.
This scripture reading is John 2, 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, the soul now to stand. You stood before my failure. Carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? to you. So I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, this life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. What can I do to offer this heart, oh God, completely to you? What can I say? What can I do to offer this heart? the one who gave it all. So I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender all. I am, it is your Can I 
say And what can I do But offer this heart of God Completely This morning, um, we like to bring your attention to the candles over here on this side of the sanctuary. Uh, if you have a prayer that you'd like to offer, you can either write it on the prayer offering and put it on the cross, or you can light a candle in prayer for somebody or something. We also um, accept online offerings um, on our website and on our app, and you can also, uh, if you don't mail it in, you can bring it to the boxes in the sanctuary, in the Narthex lobby. Our prayer families this morning are Ruby Sanford and Alan and Carol Seifert, and I do not have any special prayer concerns from them. And so now it is time to stand up and greet one another. We are so glad you're here today, and especially those who, uh, as we said, um, figured out how to set their alarm clocks. It is the roughest day of the year, and this week will probably be the roughest week of the year. But you know what? God is still good, and we're alive, and it's amazing. So we're grateful. But do be in prayer. I mean, this is serious, that this is one of the hardest times of the year for many people around the nation, especially in places where the sun doesn't shine as much. And it really leads to a lot of depression. This is where depression spikes in our nation. We need to know that. And so be in prayer for folks that that doesn't happen. We already see depression spiking a lot um, after COVID and, and after all these fun little electronic devices that we glue our attention to have, have caused a lot of havoc in our lives that um, we don't need any extra depression. So please be praying for our country. Um, just so you know, you can hold that scripture. We'll get to it in a second. Let me just um, set, the, set the tone a little bit for us today before we do. Mary Thomas was the, the mother of nine children on Chicago's west side. Standing at five foot four inches, she was anything but physically imposing. But Mary had a deep sense of her role as the protector of her family. In a neighborhood where gangs and drugs and, and violence was the norm, Mary's job wasn't very easy. You may know and have heard of one of her sons, Isaiah Thomas, the original Isaiah Thomas from the Detroit Pistons of the 80s and 90s, Hall of Fame NBA player and, now, and also coach. One day when her sons were getting older, gang members came by her house and they told her, we want your boys they can't walk around here and not be in no gang. Mary replied, there's only one gang around here, and that's the Thomas gang, and I lead that. When the gang leader started to make threats, Mary went inside the house. She returned to the porch with a sawed-off shotgun. <laughs> Get off my porch, she is reported to have said, or I'll blow you across the expressway. Hmm. How do you react to that story? I, I wonder. I mean, you can take this a few different ways. I mean, do you want to cheer for the mom? Obviously, there's some humor in it, too. You might be deeply, you might recoil at the threat of violence or the fact that a mother of nine children needs to resort to the threat of violence to protect her children. I mean, that's a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a take, a, a legitimate take. Our biblical passage today is set in a context that forces us to consider the same questions of God that we do of Mary in this story. To catch up in the story where we're at, God created a good world with good creations. God empowered some of those creations to rule in ways that reflected his loving and just rule. One of the creations were spiritual beings, spiritual forces, powers. You can see them throughout the Bible, and anytime we read them, our modern ears don't really know what to do with them. We sometimes get uncomfortable, but there they are. They are all throughout the Bible. The Bible uses one of the Hebrew words for God to describe them, but it's a different 
word than used for the creator God. So in a sense, it's a lowercase g God to describe these powers. There they are. The story goes on to say that these powers rebel against God, whether it's because they were given authority and it went to their head, we don't know, but at least that's how it sometimes happens with us humans. And that's where the story actually takes a turn. You see, those spiritual forces, those created beings that have authority to rule, excuse me, the, the, uh, uh, the created beings on earth that have authority to rule are humans. So the powers in the heavens are these powers. The ones on earth are us. And the spiritual beings demand allegiance from the humans. And they get that by wooing them and deceiving them so that the humans stop giving their allegiance to the creator God and start giving it to the lower case G gods. This is a mess for obvious reasons, for so many reasons. And so the creator God, the almighty God, decides to act. It decides may not be the right word. That's a human way of saying it. God acts. And what does God do? God picks one family out of the many families of earth, the many created human beings, the family of Abraham, later called the Hebrews. But this man, Joseph, is exalted to the highest position in Egypt other than Pharaoh himself, the king of Egypt. He's given this place. The first book of the Bible ends with this happy ending. Ah, that's great. The second book starts where it left off. But this time, many years have passed. A new Pharaoh came into power, and this new Pharaoh did not remember Joseph, did not remember all the good things that Joseph did for, the, for Egypt and the Egyptian people. The Bible tells us that he doesn't remember them. Instead, he's afraid of them. And so he enslaves them and oppresses them. Fear. One of the Hebrew people, Moses, tries to bring justice for the people through violence, but that ends poorly. And he, he goes out as a refugee into the wilderness where God meets him and sends him back and says, I want you to go back to Pharaoh and say, what? Let my people go, for those of you at home who did not hear what these fine people said. So he goes back. He tells Pharaoh. Pharaoh refuses. The story tells us that Pharaoh hardened his heart and refused to let the people go. As the story goes on, there's a subtle shift where God hardens Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh's heart was so hard to begin with. Last week, we explored the connection between Pharaoh and the lowercase g gods, those powers, those things that, that deceive us and claim and corrupt our lives. We explored how these gods, if you want to call them that, they could be called powers, authorities, is how the Bible often talks about them how they're still at work today to distort our thinking and demand our allegiance. Pharaoh's allegiance to the gods makes him crazy in the story. One Pharaoh is killing babies because he's so crazy. That's crazy. So what does God do about it? God hosts a showdown. We talked about this last week. A showdown with the gods of Egypt. Not with Pharaoh, but with the gods of Egypt. God unleashes 10 plagues to show all people that the gods of Egypt don't have any power compared to the creator God. Amen. But the land of Egypt and Pharaoh at the helm refuse to listen. Okay, so our passage today, it's important to get the context. Our passage today falls at the end of this showdown, the very end, the last plague of the ten. And it's one of the most famous of all the plagues and one of the most difficult sometimes for folks to deal with. It's the death of the firstborn son and firstborn animals during what we call the Passover. From Exodus 12, verses 12 through 13, we read, On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people 
and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word, a word that maybe we've known for many, many years, maybe a word we've only heard today. God, we pray that your spirit would speak to us into our hearts and into our minds where we are today in this time and in this place to enrich our hearts with your loving truth. your name we pray, amen. Let me ask you, after hearing that story, that not the the, the long prologue, but that what I just read from Scripture, After hearing that bit, why did God strike down every firstborn? Why did God strike down? I don't know if anyone wants to yell something out. You can if you want. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thought. I wonder if as you're answering that question in your mind, you're thinking about all of the causes, all of the story I just gave you, right? of the slavery and the oppression of the injustice. And sometimes it can be hard to take the the death of first-born children. Well, let's think about it one more time and look at it, actually. Go back to the the second slide, that second verse. I I think it's actually the first verse. Let's see. Go back. Go back. Go back. Backwards. There we go. Uh, Okay. Okay. It says, why? I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. And we think, but wait, you're killing the firstborn child. I can absolutely empathize with people when they read this. Thank you very much, Katie. When they read stories like this one in the Bible. You know, stories of God and violence. Death. These are hard to hear. Some people try to ignore them like they are not there because they don't seem too loving. Some lean into the violence and say, if you don't do what God tells you to do, God will deal with you the same way with violence. Finally, some give up on God altogether. Folks who have seen what violence looks like from religious folk. But I don't think, if you're reading this and wanting to be faithful to how it's written, I don't think any of those three work. It doesn't work to say that the Old Testament doesn't apply to us anymore. It doesn't work to say God is violent. It doesn't work to say, well, obviously you're here, so you know this, that I don't need God anymore. Why? Because Jesus This is a story describing the God of the Hebrew people, the God of Jesus, the God who is love. It's a story that Jesus himself uses as the foundational story, one of the prime foundational, but especially the foundational story for his life's ministry goal, the death of Jesus on the cross. This is what he said when he said the scriptures are fulfilled, the law, the prophets, the writings, all of this points to this moment. And the Passover becomes really the story that's foundational to that for him. How can I say that? It's a big claim to make. Do I know Jesus? Am I in his brain? Mm-mm. Today is the fourth Sunday of a season we call Lent. It's a time of preparation to remember Jesus' death, of repentance, of reshaping and, and be regrounding in the truth of the gospel as we prepare for Jesus' death and resurrection. It's, this death is an event, the event, not an event, the event, that reshapes reality itself. How we are to be lived, what our identity is. And it gives definitive shape to the Christian faith. So what does any of this have to do with Passover? 
and the powers. Well, as Barbara read, you might be wondering, why did Barbara read one verse today? <laughs> it was kind of odd. You got her, you had her walk all the way up here, stand behind this lectern and read one verse and then walk back and sit down. The verse she read, did, did, you, did you hear? The Passover was coming. And so Jesus went into Jerusalem. Jesus purposes his journey to the cross as a remembering and retelling of the story of Passover. This is vitally important. And this leads, like Moses, like God in Egypt, it leads to a showdown with the powers. But now the powers don't just infect Egypt and Pharaoh. They're infecting even the Hebrew people as well. The leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the temple priests, all of them are infected by these powers. And so God goes back, goes into Jerusalem for a showdown through Jesus. It was immediately after he celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples, before the food was even digested in his stomach, that he was arrested and crucified with the Passover meal still inside of him. Jesus himself told his followers in John 12, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Remember what God said? I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Jesus said, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Jesus defines his whole act as a model from the Passover, pulls from the Passover and what the Passover is all about as a definer for who he is and what he does. On the cross where Jesus died, he conducts a second Passover event. The blood of the lamb spilled in order for those who are dead, the walking dead, to have life. Jesus pulls the full force of evil onto himself and on the cross is where he judges those powers and finds them bankrupt. Jesus' own followers would make the connection between Jesus, the Passover, and the powers. You heard our readers who did a fantastic job today from Revelation 5. What did they say? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. A lot of us connect this moment to the Day of Atonement where Israel's sins are forgiven. In that event where Israel's sins are forgiven, you don't sacrifice lambs. You sacrifice what? A bull, a goat. And then you put the sins on one of the goats and send them out. There's no lamb. This is definitely tied into this event and to Jesus' death. We'll talk about that on Good Friday. But when it says, worthy is the lamb who was slain, Jesus' own followers, John, who has this vision of heaven, writes about the lamb who is slain. That's Passover, friends. Jesus' own life and death. Yes, even his resurrection is tied to this very moment. We'll talk about the resurrection and how it's tied to this moment in history next week. This is the defining event behind Jesus' death. And it all comes down to this one thing. What is it? Okay, so YouTube videos, they often have there's this one guy who does this thing in the videos where he says, bring it in close, bring it in close. And it's kind of humorous, you know, bring it in close. No, no, closer, closer, get right here, right here on the camera, right here on me. And this is that moment. In the Passover, God judges the powers of Egypt. In Jesus' death, God judges the powers for the entire world rescuing us from all forms of slavery and oppression, from hardened hearts and from evil in all its form. 
God judges the powers that enslave us. This moment, Passover in Jesus' death, is God's judgment upon the powers. The powers that sometimes run and ruin our lives, that claim and corrupt us. These powers that drive us without us even knowing. Yes, even those of us who say yes to Jesus can oftentimes kind of fall back to joining the powers. What powers do God, does God judge in this story? The first power is the spirit of slavery. We see this in the story, right? You can't avoid it. It's in the Exodus story. And what God judges in Pharaoh's act of enslaving this people, this Hebrew people. This is an unholy demon that ensnared the hearts of so many who treat others as property. It can happen as institutional in this story or as in the rise of chattel slavery during the, uh, about hundreds, hundreds of years ago. It can also do things for us as we don't treat others with the human dignity that God has given them. It's the same spirit. Many Christians throughout history, detached from the powers, worked toward the dignity of all. The rich and the poor, all ethnicities. This was the early Christian community. That's what they did. People who were dying, who were left out to die, Christians, faithful Christians, at the risk of their own health of getting a disease, would pick up these people and take care of them in their final days. Some of these Christians dying from the same plague that this person had, but they wouldn't let them die outside alone. They weren't tethered to the powers. That's not always been the case with us, but it is our core. This also happens in how we respond to one another today. Whenever the spirit of dehumanization or demonization arises, this is that same spirit. And it goes all ways, across all political aisles and up and down and all across, around and everything. It happens when we think the worst of our political enemies, when in our minds we draw horns on those people. We're succumbing to the spirit and the power of slavery, of dehumanization, of Pharaoh's gods of Egypt. God judges this power and it is condemned in Jesus' death. The second power is the spirit of force. The idea that we can get what we want by making people do something that we want them to do is a folly as old as time. Right? Notice I even said that the powers don't tell people they have to do this. They woo them and deceive them. They know, the spiritual powers know that you can't force someone. It eventually goes south. But that same spirit dwelling in us, makes us think we can. To force people to do the thing that we want them to do, it doesn't work. God is not a God of force. God is not a God of control. God is a God who asks for trust. When God calls the very first Hebrew, Abraham, he called Abraham And made a covenant with Abraham. He didn't command Abraham, believe in me or else. No. Trust. And that trust was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. Abraham believed God, but wasn't berated by God into believing. That's the powers. Those are the forces that are all around us and infect us. It infected the mind of a pharaoh, and it can often infect us today, the spirit of force. The final power is the spirit of death. This is one that's an enemy to us all. Whenever we give our hearts to the powers, we are in jeopardy of walking toward the grave. Egypt experienced that death in the Passover. Why? Because it had given itself over to the powers. It had become one with the powers. God's judgment had to come upon the powers of Egypt, but God gave a way through. It was a way through for 
not only Hebrew, but also Egyptian. We read later in chapter 12 that other people came with the Hebrew people, not just the Hebrews. Some Egyptians smeared the blood on the doorpost as well to worship this creator God and put allegiance back to where it was demanded. It was for anyone who smeared the blood. The the thing I love is that it was even for the poor who didn't have a lamb to begin with. The Bible makes it very clear. If there are poor people who don't have a lamb, find a way for them to get something. Because even they need to be able to smear the blood. It wasn't just for the wealthy, those who had lambs. Mm -mm. It was for anyone. Life, a way through death. Because death, the spirit of death, is the spirit of the gods of Egypt. We want so desperately for God to judge powers. But in stories like this, It hurts our minds to see humans being affected. But we know oftentimes, even we will give our hearts to powers where when God judges those powers, we can't say, God, judge the powers, but don't judge me even though I benefited from the powers at the expense of others. You know, just give me a pass, but judge the powers because those are bad, but not me. No. See, God does judge the powers. And he brings natural consequences on humans, but God provides a way through. He doesn't ignore. There is no injustice with God. There is justice. When we give our hearts to the powers, God still provides a way through. God doesn't just say, the end, you're done. You did something wrong, you're done. That's not how our God works. Yeah, amen. Amen. And so, God, even though we are in league with the powers of death, we always have an option. Take the blood. Smear it. For those of us Christians, it's putting our faith in Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins for us. Take the blood. Leave the powers. You have a chance. You can do it. And this is the message God doesn't turn a blind eye to injustice, but God offers a way through, a way for everyone. God doesn't ignore sin, but God deals with it in Jesus on the cross. In the Passover story, it was a lamb provided for everyone, and now it was God's own son, who in a few weeks, we will remember his sacrifice, his death, his atoning work for the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus, God judged death and all the powers itself. In 1 Corinthians 15, while Paul is talking about Jesus' resurrection, Paul writes this. I love this. And you may have this, this scripture in front of you in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, Then when he comes, those who belong to them, to him. Verse 24. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has what? Destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. It's right there in front of us. These powers, these things that try to claim our lives, no, Jesus has judged them on the cross. Jesus owns them. Jesus is king, not these powers. Jesus hands over the kingdom to the Father after judging and destroying all of these wicked forces. It goes on. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So let us ask ourselves, to what powers have I given my allegiance in the past? Is it the powers that demonize others? Is it the powers that dehumanize and degrade the dignity God has given to others, even my enemies? Maybe it's the power of control or the equally dangerous on the other end of the spectrum, the power of apathy. When control doesn't go my way, I give up. Hmm. Neither. Neither are powers of God. Whatever the power is, 
God has judged it on the cross. And it is found lacking. It's wanton. It's corrupt. It's decrepit. Are we willing to continually offer those up? This is Lent. This is that time. To take assessment, not of others, not of the people outside. Look here. Are we willing to let those go, those powers? The power of dehumanization, of control, of death itself. To take on the love and faithfulness of Jesus Christ. When we, like those first Hebrew people and the righteous Egyptians do this, we will experience once more, as we always do, a flood of God's love and justice unknown in this world. We might come to Passover the way Jesus did, a judgment. We might come to know Passover the way Jesus did, which is a judgment on the powers and an invitation to new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. God, in the midst of a world that lacks righteousness, justice, truth, faithfulness, we thank you for sending your Son to set the record straight, to reorient our lives, and to give us our salvation in this grand operation of salvation. We pray that you would turn our hearts toward Jesus and not towards fleeting, shadowy figures that seem to be Jesus, but that don't hold a candle to the real thing. God, we pray that you'd continue to work in our hearts, knowing that you have saved us through faith, that that is not a question. The question is not whether or not we will be with you. The question is, what are we going to do until we get there? And what sort of kingdom are we participating in? God, continue to work in our hearts to relinquish control, to relinquish the, the spirit of slavery, to give up the powers of death that control us even when we don't even know it. God, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts so that they are not like Pharaoh's, hardened against your word, against your truth. So, God, to that end, as always, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as we worship our God, the God who judges the powers together.
Um, a few quick announcements before you go. Offering your service in response to the word. Uh, our food drive is this week. Our new schedule is the second and fourth Thursday the food will be delivered. So the Sunday before that is when we will start the deliveries. So Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday deliveries to the church, and then we deliver it on the fourth Thursday. And the next one, okay, everybody is um, doing this. So if you have an online recurring giving through PushPay, we would like you to go in to the new app, which is Church Center, or go on the website and put your recurring giving in there and pretty immediately after you do that, within 24 to 72 hours, we will cancel your one through push pay. One was done this weekend, and I know we say 72 hours, but it was canceled uh, right away. And then this app is something you maybe want to download. I know, not maybe, yes you do, because it will eventually have our directory in it. And that also, you'll have your calendar, your directory, your giving, uh, your groups that you're in, and when you meet and everything. It's, it's a perfect app. It's perfect. <laughs> Next. Easter is March 31st. We are not going to be outside this year. We're going to be inside at 10 o'clock. And we'll have all kinds of fun that day. And Holy Week on Monday, Thursday, we're having a Seder at 7 p.m. in Trinity Center. If you have the app, I think you can sign up for that. 
And um, on Good Friday, we'll have a worship service at 7 p.m. in the worship center. So it's time for you to send. Fantastic. Yes, this is that opportunity to serve when we take what God has spoken to us during this service and are sent out. And you are sent out to go. Go knowing that the God of the universe, the God that is above all gods, it's not a comparison. It's a different essence altogether. The God that judges the powers. The God that gives us new life. That God goes with you. As we faithfully follow Jesus who lives in you. As we walk in the wisdom of the Spirit working through you. Until that day when all is made well in a kingdom that shall have no end. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.